Hi guys. Welcome. Let me see if I've got everybody in here. Here we go. Welcome, welcome to Chilean wine at night afternoon. <laughs> I think I'm I've got a lot of people in here. Hi guys. So um thank you all. I'm we're gonna just chat for a minute here. I'm gonna go over the um, housekeeping and such for um for the class. Um, so welcome to Sip with a Psalm at Home Tasting Club. Bam. Um, we are still COVID style, obviously, but wow, what a day. Oh my gosh, it was so beautiful out there and it still is. And I am um, excited to, for summer now. It finally hit today. We got our furniture out and everything. So today I will be leading the class and we have Claire Desolette, who is, um, will you say hi, Claire? And so you're, hi. I don't know if that brought people to your screen. I'm not sure. Um, where were you today working? At the Barking Cat. So if you have pets and needs, give me a call and I'll try to help you. <laughs> Any kind of special needs. Special need, special need cats and dogs. Is that what you said? <laughs> well, yeah, allergies and tolerances personality issues got it personality issues you can take care of that that's oh yeah <laughs> okay um well great so claire is going to be penny today in the class and claire's so gonna try to be penny oh you're going to try to be not penny, penny. Yeah, no one can be penny you're right um so uh, as we go through to refresh your memory about how this works, if since we have so many people on the call, which is really exciting, you guys, this is really fun. We're getting um, a lot of people interested. Um, so as you, if you have a question as we go along, um, type it into the chat box. And it doesn't matter, you can either private message Claire, which means there's a drop down. You'll see in the message box that has um, either everyone is showing right now for me, or you can select someone in the group uh, to, to send a message to. So you can either do everyone with a question, you can type it in, no problem, or you can direct one to Claire. Um, she will be watching for your questions and at depending and end comments really as well and then as I finish up a little um, story or something she's going to indicate to me that um, there's a question and then what what she'll do is call on you and say okay Donald um, unmute, unmute yourself and um, you know let's hear your question or your comment um, share with us what you've got so um, and then we'll if you'll remute mute yourself so we want to keep everybody on mute um, unless the person is asking a question so that we we don't have um, the screen get interrupted based on um, sounds that come through the Zoom call. So um, if you're not already muted, if you'll go ahead and do that um, on your on your call here. So welcome to Chilean wines. We I, we had so much fun with these wines at my house. Um, we've had them open for a couple nights, and we would sit. The glasses, um, you know, this about yay much in the glass. And we, my son is a W set, so that's Wine and Spirits Education Trust. Uh, my son is a level two. And so we have these wine conversations. My poor 15 year old is left in the dust. She sits there and sips her cranberry juice. But um, my son and I have had a lot of fun talking about these wines because in some ways they were so similar and in other ways they were so different. And we, we had fun talking about what they paired with on the plate as we were going through the dinners. So anyway, that's been really fun for um, us here. Oops, here's someone else coming in. Um, so what I want to do is start with a completely interesting change that um, is in the industry and in the world and so I made a big mistake. Let me share my screen. I know, what, what, Kirsten? So I'm sharing my screen. So here is South America. And these are the wine, the areas that are making wine. Um, and 
You can see Chile here. Here's what we're looking at today, this area here, Chile, that skinny, long little country there. And then we've got Argentina, this whole area here that is just um, huge and produces a huge amount of wine compared to um, uh, Chile. Then we've got a little bit up here in, in Peru and then some little areas in Bolivia that we're, we're starting to see some wines produced out of Uruguay here. You can see uh, Brazil has a few areas as well. We don't get a lot of these in Utah, um, but, and there's some up here, right boy at the equator, the very, um, very hot air area there. So that's, that's what we're looking at. And when you think about the whole entire continent, this area down here, let me see if I, shoot, my screen will not let go of that bar. So I'm sorry, I'm sure there's a way to easily get rid of this bar here, but I can't figure it out. So, oh, well, look at that. Um, so anyway, when you think about it right down here, off the, down in this area is Antarctica, and then you've got the equator up here. So this is a, you know, hot, and then comes across and then there are a variety of different regions in the middle here and then it's pretty darn chilly down here. So we've also got the Andes Mountains running um, up. Let me just let somebody else into the room here. Um, so then we have the Andes Mountains running up this area here which are very high, have a lot of snow, and they the snow from both sides of the mountains feed Argentina and and Chile with water. So this is great. Now I was going to I was going to totally tell you about my mistake. So let me see if I can get rid of this move window. No, that's not what I wanted to do. I just want to get rid. Of, okay, there we go. Let me show you what I did. This is the wine regions that you saw on the map I sent you. And I just pulled out, so I have a, I've paid a fee to the Society of Wine Educators to be able to use their, their maps. And so I pulled it out and I, I have these loaded on my computer and I've purchased newer ones in the, um, in the interim. And I, but I accidentally went back to the, one of the old, maps. Now this was a map from 2007. So I want you to notice here what's happened in the basically 15 or so years since this was created. Um, this is the area they considered the wine region in Chile. Now I grabbed this map to the right, the bluer map, from Wine Folly. It's a great reference website. Look at how big down in this corner Look at how big they now consider the wine region in Chile. And I've drawn the red lines here across the wine folly map. That is indicative of what my map on the, other, on the 2007 map, that's the only area that they considered wine regions back in 2007. Look at all these other regions that are growing wine now in Chile. So it's a fascinating study as the world of wine continues to change. Even when you think you've got it under your belt, it will, um, it will come back and get you. Um, and and uh, if you don't pay attention, and I didn't pay attention, and I would grab that map and threw it in there. And that's about, look, it's a, only about a third of what the, the regions are now. So um, let's go on and talk a little bit about you make sure there's no one waiting. It looks like everyone's here. Yay. Okay, so we've got our first wine, um, which is the Meli, the Carignan. This one, Meli Carignan. And this is a 2000, I've got a 2015. I don't know what you guys have out there. Um, the 2000, I have a 2015. Now, this wine is very, 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 very interesting to me. And I, wanted to see how many of you, if you'll raise your hand, um, how many of you 
when you first smelled this wine, the description I had sent was raspberry, so as you smelled, raspberries, cranberries, cinnamon, and savory meat. Um, and I I'm curious if you guys out there smelled both the cinnamon and the savory meat. So you can do a swirl and try to get into this wine here. I mean, I've never s smelled a wine that came across with so much savory meat that I thought someone had been steeping beef jerky in this or <laughs> something. Do, are you guys getting that? I don't see, let's see if I, let me go to gallery view and see hands up if, uh, Did you? if we've got anybody who else who's, we don't have a lot of hands, so. Such an intro. Okay, we got a few. Yep. I see Nancy. Yep. So Karen Yen. All right. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, Karen Yen is a a wine that is was is grown a lot in the southern part of France. And um it is it used to be considered a pretty uh, low-end blending wine. It just wasn't something that people were growing for for itself. It just wasn't enough. And so um, a lot of the Carignan, gra Carignan grapes were um, planted with other other grapes took over that area, that those area, those um, the places that those vines were growing. There were some left though, there still are many left in the southern region of France. But what happened was Carignan that was brought over to Chile and um, it was planted. And it was planted a long time ago because many, many of the Im immigrants that hit Chile were from, hold on, they were first from, So initially into Chile, uh, into South America, we had um, Spanish and Portuguese emigrating into the area, but then we had immigrating into the area, em emigrating out of their area. But then we added um, Italian, French, and Germans into the South American area. And, and many of those, as you imagine, all of them really have very, very strong histories of grape growing and winemaking. So as they did that, they brought these grapes with them and planted them wherever they happened to land, whether it was in um, Argentina or it was ever in Chile or in Peru. And these grapes have been growing in these regions for a long, long time. So this family, and let me show you a picture of these. these uh, find. This. Okay. So um, let me show you. Here is our friend uh, uh, Adriana Cerda. Adriana Cerda. She is the one that found this, uh, these Carignan grapes growing and along with some Riesling grapes that were over 50 years from. Um, being planted a long time ago. Now this is in the Maule Valley. And um, let's see if I go, if I can get us backwards. So she is planting this in this area here, the Maule Valley. And as you can see, it used to be the, only one, the, the bottom of where they thought down here was gonna get too cold they thought it was gonna to be too cold to grow grapes. And you know, 15 years ago, things have changed as, we were, as our planet warms up and it probably was too cold, but now you can grow grapes in these areas. But back then, this was the line and sh her vineyard is in this Maule Valley area. And these grapes, a Riesling is certainly well suited for cooler regions. The Carignan, it's just a grape that can grow almost anywhere. So it, 
um, doesn't necessarily need any kind of cooler regions, but it's very, um, it's very hardy and it will grow almost anywhere. So she found these and decided to keep them. And she decided to dry farm um, these, these grapes. So um, what that means is she took, she does not use any irrigation in the vineyards. Maybe you've seen uh, dry farming referenced on labels and such, and it means that they are not actively irrigating those vineyards. The only moisture that they get is from the rain um, that comes into the vineyard itself. And they're, they're, they're really, it's an interesting um, choice that the winemaker, that the grape grower and the winemaker make, in this case, it's all Adriana, but if you don't irrigate, the roots go much further down into the soil to get their uh, moisture. And so you end up with these roots that can be 20 feet deep under the vines. If you irrigate, if you wet the soil on the top, the vines go wide because they go out and find that the irrigation paths and they go wide. The challenge with wide is typically you can't, you've got vines that'll go, you know, start interacting and, and choking each other if they go wide, but also a lot of the character of a grape's um, complexity comes from all those different soils that the vines are, are, are having to grow through basically. So it's a lot of complexity that you get from the, um, the fact that these, these vines go very, very deep. And these are 60 year old Carignan um, wine um, grapes and the Rieslings it looks like are that old as well. So they have really nice cool, cool nights, which is very important for grapes because if it doesn't get cool enough, at night, the grape just gets too sugary and what they call almost flabby. They just, um, it makes wines that are, that lack the acid um, that we like in our wines. So um, that acidic uh, character is kept by those cool nights, chilling those grapes down and stopping all of that, that sugar growth and then warming it up the next day. So. Um, that's a really nice way to grow grapes, diurnal. Okay, so that's our, that's, uh, yes, Claire, I see your hand up. Excuse me? You're, you're on mute. Are you there? Yeah. Do you have anybody else waiting to come in? Uh, June said that maybe Jeff wanted to join. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. My apologies to those of you who I kept in the waiting room too long. I got all into my story and I didn't check the participant list. I'm sorry. Oh my gosh, this technology. So, um, all right. So welcome. And again, I'm sorry. So Claire, what we're doing is you're keeping yourself on mute. If you have a question, type it into the um, into the chat and Claire will let me know about the question and then we'll unmute, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. And thank you, June, I really appreciate that. <laughs> thank you for watching out for the other students. Um, okay, so let me go back to sharing my screen. Okay, so this is our, our hero, Adriana. Let's, test her, let's taste her wine while we're, while we're looking at her. So she is um, making this Karen Yen. And what I want you to do is remember there are five S's. There is the first S is sight. So you want to tip it away from you and look through it where I don't have a lot of light in my room here. Um, it looks, it's pretty dark um, from what I'm seeing. And it, since it's a 2015, I'm seeing a little bit of a more rusty red on the side than you may be seeing depending on the age of your wine. Reds get rustier looking as they get older. Um, but a little bit of rust there. Then you, then you do a swirl. Second S is swirl. You want to lift the aroma molecules into the glass. And then um, we're going to stick our noses in here and do a scent 
sniff, smell. Like I said, for me, this wine is coming across as just the most uh, savory in, in many cases I've ever smelled. Um, and then we've got the fourth one, which is the sip. Let it play around in your mouth. And then the fifth is the savor or the finish. And I wouldn't call this a long, long finish, but it's still in my, I can still taste it in my mouth. So um, as I did the research, it's, they called out a medium finish. So that makes sense. So uh, it all makes sense. And then um, I'd be curious how you guys liked this with food. Um, let me see what our next, here is, I love Wine Folly. I will just say it right now, such a great company, great research. They did a, a, flavor, a, pre, bleh, a flavor profile on this wine. So, um, and if you've never seen this layout before, it's something to really pay attention to because um, it really is um, something that, let me see, it looks like there might be one more. Is there one more in the room? Hold on, I don't know how to get back. <laughs> you guys, I'm sorry, I'm such a noob here. Um, um, is there someone waiting in, okay, no, shoot, I, okay, sorry, if there, Claire, um, unmute yourself and let me know if someone's waiting at some point, please, because um, I can't seem to get to that chat area where I see that. Um, Anyway, so Wine Folly has amazing information. You can see they're calling it Carignan here, but it's also called Carignano, Carignana in Spain, when I was in Spain, Carignana, and Mazuelo as well in Spain. So the, this is the Italian Carignano, Carignano and um, Carignana and Mazuelo. So you get to see that. And then it goes into what they consider the predominant colors, I mean, um, aromas in the wine and then they go into the taste profile so we've got heavy fruit this is hot this is low medium low medium medium high high so this is high fruit medium body medium tannin high acidity and higher medium high alcohol so that is a really helpful um, slide for us on um, that Anything, um, so that's our, okay, so I had this last night with a, um, a, a chicken, that we did chicken and breasts and thighs. We, I just sauteed them in a little bit of olive oil on the stove. We put them with some green beans that were also sauteed, with a little bit of garlic salt on top of the green beans, and then we just did a, a green salad. And for me, I'll just tell you about my experience. First thing, both of these wines went beautifully with the chicken. Um, and let me explain one thing that I learned, and I have to tell you, I'm not sure I'm a really big fan of this, but I will tell you about it anyway, because it truly does change the flavor of the food and the wine. So I did an advanced food and wine pairing certification um, a couple years ago. And um, and it was an eight day program. I mean, it was intense. And the way that they do their food and wine pairing is different. And um, in my opinion, more advanced in terms of food and wine pairing experiences than I've seen a lot. A lot. So what I've usually seen is someone will take a bite of food, chew, swallow, and then take a sip of wine or vice versa. They'll take a sip of wine, put it, their glass down, swallow obviously, and then take their bite of food. We were taught in this advanced certification class that you actually want to marry the food in your mouth. Um, and what should happen is when the bite is in your mouth and you add the wine, it will actually change the flavor of both the wine and the food and hopefully create a better um, or a, a different or a, you want it to be a good experience, obviously, but a different 
experience. I, I won't call it better because that doesn't mean that the food alone or the wine alone is bad, but it, it could, it's a different experience. And so I was playing with that last night and it's very hard for me to do um, because I've not, I, I only learned this two years ago and I've not got that technique down. It's just not natural to me. So I end up feeling like I'm chewing this like super watery food. Um, it's just very odd, but try that if you don't already already do that and see what happens next time you've got food with the wine. Both of these wines went very well with the chicken that I had last night. And what was interesting was, we'll get into the um, Carmenere next, but because Carmenere has such a bell peppery, green bean kind of, it's called a pyrazine, uh, pyrazine um, in it, it's that aroma of green pepper, jalapeno, that kind of thing. It went, the, the uh, Carignan, um, excuse me, the Carmenere went way better with the green beans than with the chicken. So um, yes, Claire, please do talk. Well, we do have a comment from Brooke and she agrees with you that this wine is way better with food than it is on its own. And we have a question from Sean, or Sean, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Um, his question is really interesting. At what elevation is this grape to typically grown in Chile. Hmm. Oh, thank you, Sean. Uh, so, let me show you. Most of the wine regions in Chile, let me see if I'm gonna be able to do this. I think I can do this. Um, I'm going to show you a, a cross cut map right here. It's going to be over on this side. And what you're going to be seeing, let me see if I can get, I'll get it closer in a second, but let me, let me outline it in a set for a second. These are the Andes. This, so this is elevation going down. And these are the Andes. And this is coming down into this, the valley. And then there's a little, um, they call it a coastal range, a very low coastal range of about, um, they, let me see what the elevation is on that. Yeah, so like, 3,000 feet, um, the coastal, um, let me make sure I'm not gonna dump over all the wine here. Um, the, the coastal range is up at 3,000 feet and the, and the Andes you know, are up at um, 20,000 feet. And so you can see that there's a little dip in most of the, um, in that entire country that has that coastal range, then the grape regions are actually lower and then the Andes go up. So these are actually, um, I would say in a general sense, in the 500 um, to 1500 to 2000 feet above sea level range. So great question, Sean. Did I answer your question? You can unmute yourself if I didn't. I don't, I don't, am I, there we go. Are we good? Okay. Um, all right, so. That is our expose on the Carignan grape. Does anybody have any questions about it or want to talk about your food? Anybody have any experiences when you were pairing it um, with your food? And Brooke, so you must have had an experience because you're saying it's not as good um, in the glass right now as it maybe was with food. And I'd be curious what you paired it with. Um, I took your advice on the spicy turkey and I did a mole, um, like a spicy mole with the turkey, like a dark meat. Uh -huh. And um, it was really like, it tasted really good. They paired well together, but drinking it just out of the glass, it, it doesn't, it doesn't taste as good to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's just my personal. Yeah. Um, can I ask you before you log off or before you mute yourself, when you're doing a tasting, um, and we're when I was talking about the order of the what you're doing, are you actually taking the wine in with your bite or are you doing it sequentially? Yeah, probably sequentially. Although I think with some food, like there's probably some food on your tongue, you right. know, like a, like a softer cheese or a, a creamier sauce that probably is on your tongue when you're drinking the wine. So um, probably a little bit, but I'm not chewing them together. Yeah, that was, thank you. That was such an odd experience for me and something that I'm still working on to try to get that into my 
my repertoire. Okay, well, if that's, if we're, if everybody's okay, then let's move on to Carmen Air. Um, and first, I have one more question yes. before you move on. Yes. So June is asking, and I, I'm really interested in this answer, is what vegan food does it pair with? We have oh, a few dear. vegans here. Interesting. Okay, well, I am not a vegan, June. I'm trying very, very much to choose recipes that go all over the gamut, but I'm not sure I've picked a vegan recipe yet for anything. Um, I don't think that roasted butternut squash couscous bowl um, is vegan. There's probably butter or something in that. Sorry. Okay, so let me just, so for me, when this goes well with a chicken, so this, like I said earlier, has a major savory character for me. So then when I think of savory vegetables or experiences, and I wish my daughter was here, but because she has cooked vegan for a long time, um, I would say you want to go into the root vegetables. Um, I would say mushrooms certainly have that savory character. Um, and does any, if anybody else, if anybody else has any suggestions um, based on all, you know, a, an all vegetarian um, diet, I would love to hear that for, from anybody, if you have any input on this. Well, you, Laura is suggesting hummus. We're vegetarian. Oh. <laughs> um, so June, have you tried this with hummus? You yeah, actually, actually, I, I, um, I made my own hummus, <laughs> so it, it does pair well with it, but I would like to do something like you said, like a mushroom, bourguignon, um, which I make, you know, with, with red wine and mushrooms and onions and garlic, um, or a mushroom risotto with, you know, something savory. Sure. Yeah, yeah, something that's... hearty, savory, like you said, roasted potatoes, I think that would definitely pair well. I just think that savory, as you, if you can carry that savory into the food, which it sounds like you've got that um, gut feeling for already, that would work work well. Yeah, so I'll I'll note that I'll look for some vegan recipes as well, so um, we can include non carnivores in the <laughs> in the um, class. Thanks, June, for your question. Um, okay, so let's move on, Carmen Air. So this is, this is where we are now, this one. This is root one. Um, and Carmen Air is such an interesting, interesting uh, wine. Let's go back to our map and get um, situated. So we're back to the good map, not from 2007. And um, this is right here, the region that the Carmen Air is grown. Colchagua Valley, which is in the larger re Rappel Valley um, region. Um, and you can see it right here, Colchagua Valley. And a lot of the Carmen Airs are grown there. Now, this poor little grape, man, you guys, well, so Carmen Air is um, not a super easy grape to grow. Um, and um, in Bordeaux, France, when um, in the mid 1800s, there was um, from the United States, unfortunately, it was our, we sent, there were some winemakers in both areas, grape growers, that sent grapes back and forth uh, from France to the United States. They were exchanging uh, vines. And the our American roots, our, our American vines went over on the boats to France. And unfortunately, they did not know that also on the boat, on the vines, were a bug called phylloxera. And phylloxera, it's got an eight, it well, up to 18 life stages. Apparently, this little bug can mutate can do all sorts of things like skip stages and not even um you know we all think of a larva and then you know a, a an insect kind of thing this is one that comes out and it can go from larva straight to winged it can go it can 
lay eggs. Some of them can't lay eggs. It's all over the place. So this is what phylloxera looks like on a, on a, um, a vine. This is right here. This is how they lay their eggs. Now there are multiple stages of this, uh, this insect and it literally has multiple egg stages. So this is one of these things right here, say this one, oh, this right here, this is what it looks like if it was opened up. So all these little tiny eggs are in there. And then these hatch into what looks more like, and, and this is, again, it can go a lot of different ways, but these are the larva stage. And what they do is they start rotting and eating the roots. This is a root with these larva. And then this is what, right in this top corner, is what the roots end up looking like once there's the infestation. And once the infestation has started, they really can't do anything. So unfortunately, our, um, we did this. Uh, to Europe. And so the Bordeaux region, when after they got hit by this and really most of the vineyards were wiped out, they chose to plant the easier growing, as, I, as you saw in your notes, the easier growing Cabernet and Merlot instead of the Carmenere. And um, there, so there used to be six grape varietals in most Bordeaux blends. That included Carmenere where now there are just five um, that are listed in your notes. So now, as you can see the numbers, it's quite stunning. 70 acres is all of Carmenere that's left in France and Chile has oh, almost 22,000 acres, thank goodness. And many, many of these vines were pre phylloxera that were brought over by the immigrants. So they don't have the phylloxera louse. Also, Chile is the, one of the only regions in the entire world that can grow their grapes on their own rootstocks. Um, the way they solved the phylloxera problem was basically, even though we were the ones that caused it, we also solved it because what they did do now is most of the world's grapes, grapes are grafted onto American rootstock that is hardy and doesn't, isn't uh, bothered by phylloxera. And then the top half of the plant is the Vitis vinifera, the more European style of grape. So in this case, in Chile, most of the grapes are planted on their own rootstock, which means they don't have to um, worry about the, uh, that whole grafting time that it takes to grow the plant. They're, they're in this isolated area, like you saw um, in South America. They've got a desert to the north. They've got the Antarctic to the south. They've got the cold Pacific Ocean to the west. And they've got the Andes to the east. So literally, they are just snugged in there, and they don't have this problem. It's also a very, their sand is very, their um, soil is very sandy. So that helps as well. So, um, that is our Carmen Air. And there were about um, that when it, when it, when um, everyone was growing grapes and starting in the 70s, 80s in Chile, they were, they thought this was Merlot. So if you guys haven't had a sip yet, let's uh, make sure you get a sip of this. So five S's. Mine is got a nice magenta pink ring. Um, and it's pretty dark in the center there. So that's my, and it looks good. And then let's do a swirl and a smell. So for me, man, this just clobbers me over the head with the pyrazines, the green pepper, the jalapeno, those kinds of um, aromas. And we get that often out of other, <clears throat> other grapes that aren't ripe enough. But this is fully ripe. It's just this, this grape type, just like Cabernet, just like uh, I put it in the notes, Cabernet and, uh, where is it? Yeah, Cab Franc and this one. These are strong, strongly um, aroma therapied with pyrazines. So, that's that. Let's take a sip if you haven't already.
and then the finish. So from the nose on this, I find this, mm, wow, black pepper on that finish for me, like crazy. Um, from the nose on this, I expect this to be really heavy in my mouth. And it's not. It is a medium to almost into a light type of a, um, an experience in my mouth, which I find really interesting to get blackberries along with all those green peppers and things in the nose and then lighter in my mouth. Um, sometimes that can be off-putting. Sometimes we don't like wines that appear to be one th thing from the nose and then in the mouth, it's a different, it's a different experience. Um, sometimes it can be fun, but I'd say overall, most people don't like that. Most people want a consistent experience from the nose into the mouth. Um, and this is lighter than I, exper I, ex I would expect based on this, the aromas. Um, okay, so the Merlot, the Merlot question, it was crazy. And if you, and I didn't get this for you, dang it, I wish I'd done that. I'm just learning how to like put together the PowerPoint at the same time and show you guys. So I'm gonna be much better as we go through this. Um, but the, if you look at a Merlot leaf and you look at the Carmenere leaf, they are almost exactly the same. And if you didn't pay very, very close attention in a cursory look, you would think they're the same leaf. And so what happened was in Chile, they thought it was Merlot and they would just do, um, they would just pick these, these vines. And it turns out that up, up to half of these vines were Carmen Air, a completely different grape. And so after they figured this out, they started separating them. And um, now Carmen Air, which has completely lost its space in France, is now being grown um, there in Chile as a popular, amazing grape. And um, I always think of this, so, when I think of um, like, there are, I always think of red wine as men and white wine as women. I don't know why, sorry, that's just what I do. But I always picture a guy in a tux, when I'm drinking this Carmenere, I, drink, I picture a guy in a tux, because that's like Pinot Noir to me, very elegant, smooth, suave, right? But then in this case, you know, maybe he's got a cowboy hat on with the tux. He's a little bit rough around the edges, maybe some dirt under his fingernails and maybe some cowboy boots because this is not refined like a Pinot Noir. This is much more, um, it's rougher on the edges. It's much more rustic, but it's lighter and more elegant than I expect from the aromas. So are, is that something, oh, whoops, Darcy's coming in again. I thought she was already here. Oh, Darcy. Um, um, so anybody have questions? Let's see, let's look at the food. Again, I said last night, the green beans, we just you know quickly um, sauteed them. They were still pretty crunchy. So they still had that pretty green beany um, kind of uh, flavor. It went beautifully with the Carmenere. And again, I said that chicken had gone very well with it as well. Anybody have any, any experiences with their food pairings in anticipation of tonight that you wanna share? Well, June has an observation. June, would you like to share it? Come on. Unmute. Okay. So when you were describing the wine and the cowboyishness, right. she commented, <laughs> oh, there you go. Like, like Kevin Costner from Yellowstone. <laughs> That's who I imagine drinking it in his, you know, in his log mansion. <laughs> That's a very nice picture. Yes, June. <laughs> uh, anybody, anybody else want to share any food uh, related experiences? It's, I, I would also be curious um, if you guys are opening these ahead of this class generally or kind of waiting, opening it at the class and then going into the food and um, that will help us prepare for you guys what um what so if i can see a show of hands from the reactions let let me know if you're one who opens these ahead of time and you've had some of them and you've tried to pair them before the class okay one not two 
three. Okay, so what I'm then the rest of you I'm assuming are opening them during class, learning about them, and then taking them with you into the following week. Is that, if I can see, did I understand that correctly? <laughs> I saw the hand come in from the side there. Okay, great. Um, okay, so let's see. I will keep that in mind as we go forward because what, what I will do um, is just make sure we have these conversations rather than looking backwards. Um, I'll have these conversations about looking forward after I've experimented with some of them, if I have the opportunity to. Um, let's see, let me make sure I haven't um, forgotten anything. People are asking oh. if you suggest that they do it before, if you suggest that they wait and do it during the class. Do you is I really think that's or? number one. That's when you, when you're able to get the wines. I'm really part of that. I, um, as I go forward, <laughs> I've run into this little snafu where I don't personally control the volume of wine in this state. Believe it or not, <laughs> and <laughs> and so when I pick a wine and there might be twelve in the store here and there might be. 15 in the store in Heber and, and in Salt Lake, you know, some, uh, and then, you know, I look to see a few days later and there are three and possibly none. It's, it's a whole different. So what I try, what I'm trying to do is give you guys the shopping list so that you get the wines, whether they're opened or not before this class, that is totally up to you because you'll bring a, experience in the class if you want or you can wait listen and move into the next week sharing these wines you know with your family and with whatever food you decide you want to um, pair with it so as we move forward i am watching the volume of wine as much as possible um, and and hoping that the dabc keeps up with this part of the one of one of their recent, and I'll show you one more time. I'll sh share my screen again and show you how to look at the DABC website to see where the wines are. Um, but the DABC recently, and I want to say it was maybe two years ago, they went to a new inventory system where they are restocking the stores based on volume of sales. And so wines that sell a lot are getting more and more space in the, in the liquor stores and wines that are more obscure, hello, Carignan and Carmen Air from Chile, wines that are getting more obscure are kind of getting bullied out. Um, if you ever have a chance to, to talk to anyone of power in any alcohol related um, job in Utah, it would be great to, to let them know that we are um, we are sad to see um, these wines that are very interesting go away um, by way of you know we're going to have 14 uh, rack you know one after another of Kendall Jackson Chardonnay at some point if this is the way they continue to um, to make the wine inventory system work so sadly that's where we are but. I'm trying to watch this for you guys so that everyone can taste this or at the very minimum can taste a similar grape from the, hopefully the same region or at least the similar grape from another region that I see in inventory. So let me show you as, are there any questions? If you'll at, type your um, question into the chat box, let me show you again how um, I find, um, Wines. So here is the DABC. I, I have a link, but it's um, abc.utah.gov. Let me go to the home page. So see you see. This is what you would see as you go to abc.utah.gov. Um, they have all sorts of you know alerts as to what's going on, which usually is not this long. <laughs> um, and then you can have here find a store, but you also have right here locate a product. So click that. And you can start typing in, I'll type in our Melly from today. 
and you can see all the Melina, la, 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 Mary, Melly, Karen Yan, and you click that, and it brings up a list of what was in stock the previous day. And you can see here, Snow Creek still has six. Um, it doesn't look like uh, the uh, Heber got any, but these are the store numbers. This is their address, and you can kind of see where they are. Um, and I try, I really do try to, well, now that I'm doing this in a more active function, I'm trying to watch where, that we have some up here in the Uinta, in the, you know, Wasatch versus people having to go to Salt Lake. So that's how you do that. And if you, I also put the codes in your notes, um, no, in the shopping list, not in the PDF, but in the shopping list. And there you would actually type in this number right here, 948118, and you type that right in here, 948118, and it is another way to get to the same wine um, and find that out. So I hope that helps you guys um, with finding the wines in the future. So did well, we get- Marco and Sherry said that they had no problems finding it. So Great. that's good. Great. And if you have a minute at the end, um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. iPad six, what's your name? He has it a teaser question Joel? for us. Oh, it's Joel, iPad six? Joel has a teaser question for us. Oh, okay. Okay, Joel, just a second, don't ask yet, because I, I have a question, I wanna I end with your question, okay? Or is it appropriate to, before we end? Is it appropriate? We can do it at the end. Um, okay, we'll do it at the end, Joel. Um, okay, so you guys, what I'd like to do is I'm gonna do an informal poll. We're gonna, st we're gonna let our students know now, we're, got we're getting back in our flow, and I want to let them know, thumbs up, if we had a majority of thumbs up, they would buy, I'll tell you which wine, you'd buy the wine again, or don't answer, no thumbs up, if you wouldn't buy the wine again, okay? So that's, those are our two variables. So we're gonna start with the Melly Carignan. Thumbs up on Melly. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, all right. Thumbs and then put your hand, your thumbs down. I don't, oh, there's another thumbs up. Okay, I've got a six there. That was a physical thumbs up. Um, all right, put your thumbs down if they're not already. Okay, good. And now let me see a thumbs up if you would buy the Root One Carmen Air again. Wow, that's almost unanimous, you guys. We got a nine thumbs up. Excellent. Jean could not find it. Jean tried to find it and she couldn't. Oh, I'm sorry, Jean. Um, I hope this gets easier um, as this uh, rolls along. Okay. Um, all right. Are we ready for Joel's teaser? I think we are, Joel. Bring it. Oh, I was really more just messing with Claire to see if she could guess what my background was. Uh, anybody have a good guess? Well, I know. Oh! Where is it? Well, I know that you are an owner of a winery. Chile, maybe? Uh, this is actually nothing to do with my winery. Oh! <laughs> then I don't know what your answer is. <laughs> Oh, no, it's just Burgundy. I just sent a note to Claire saying, wishing I could be there instead of in Utah right now, but. It would be fun. I'm just experimenting with backgrounds and photos and learning Zoom, so what the heck. Oh, I see behind you there. Ah, yes. Those are fun to play with. Well, thanks, Joel. All right, Joel, guys. Joel, you can change your name from iPad 6 to your name. How do I do that, by the way? Because I got a new I iPad, I don't know how to do it. So there's three dots up at the top right corner when you put your um, when you put your cursor over the top corner right corner of your name of your yep. 
picture and it says rename. Oops, hang on. <laughs> so you can put your name on there. Kirsten, Mike and Karen are asking when they're gonna get the May shopping list. Oh, thank you. I am working on that tomorrow and Tuesday. It will be up by Tuesday evening. So we'll have, we have the Loire wines for next week and then we'll have the, the entire May shopping list will be up by Tuesday night. Yeah, it was kind of piecemeal this last time. So it's just been trying to get it all organized, but we're gonna get the whole list up so you only have to go to the store once, I hope. Thank you for asking that. Okay, guys, well, Cheers to another Sip with a Psalm at Home Wine Club. Love it. I love you guys cheersing. I'm going to get a picture of that. That is so fun. Um, and thanks, everybody, for joining us. And I will look forward to seeing you guys next week. And stay safe and keep drinking your wine. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. so much fun. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Kirsten.